welcome back uh, uh, in the last few lectures we talked about some of the basic concepts in which we started uh, we recognized arguments and uh, we could recognize arguments only when there are some premise indicators or conclusion indicators suppose if these premise and conclusion indicators are missing then we are looking for some kind of a factual claim if it is there it is well and good and then we said that uh, for uh, identifying or recognizing an argument what is most important is the inferential claim. So, if you can find the inferential claim then you can say that there seems to be some kind of argument present in a uh, given English language passage and once we identified the arguments then we identified that based on how the conclusion follows from the premises we identified that a particular kind of argument is a deductive argument in which conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and there is no new information in the conclusion which is not stated in the premises and then it is not. Uh, considered to be amplicative etc and all and we identified some of the other arguments in which the conclusion only probably follows from the premises and all and uh, there is always some kind of new information in the conclusion which is not there in the premises and all. So, these are what we call it as inductive arguments and then we also said something about non arguments such as you know somebody is giving just a piece of advice or suggestion or is uh, just giving uh, some kind of uh, explanation or expository passages etc they are all non inferential passages hence we treated them as non arguments. So, then we talked about uh, one example uh, with which uh, one method with which we could find out whether a given argument is invalid etc and all that method is called as counter example method. So, then we spoke about one particular model of argumentation which is due to Stephen Toulmin and with which you could find out what constitutes uh, what what is what is what do we mean by an effective uh, argument and all. So, there is a model which we have presented and then there we have seen that there are at least a few components of an argument or a layout of an argument which are important that is data and a claim and data and claim are supported by some kind of. Uh, uh, warrants and warrant needs to be supported by further backed up statements and then suppose if you come up uh, with any claim each claim needs to be uh, having some kind of qualifier and then it, it will have it every argument should have some kind of a rebuttal and all. So, this is what we have done so far and then now what we will do is this that uh, once we identified that they are deductive and inductive arguments and then both deductive and inductive arguments can be fallacious. So, in this lecture we will be talking about what we mean by fallacy and what kind of fallacies that we commonly come across in day to day discourse or when the arguer is said to be making some kind of mistakes in the argumentation. After all fallacy is nothing but a mistake or error or defect in the argumentation and all. So, why uh, the arguer does this mistakes and all because simply because of this that uh, all these uh, fallacies are some kind of persuasive mechanisms and all. So, we all the time want others to accept our claims and all in the process uh, sometimes we will be logical sometimes we may not be logical or uh, we make some mistakes etcetera and that is what we are going to study in this uh, lecture and all. So, in this lecture I will be focusing on two kinds of uh, two different kinds of fallacies. So, that is formal fallacies and informal fallacies and then I will talk a little bit about formal fallacies first and then we will move on to informal fallacies. Informal fallacies uh, uh, arises because of uh, some kind of problem of relevance and then I will talk about fallacies of weak induction and apart from this thing there are some kind of uh, fallacies which uh, arises out of ambiguity in the language because English language is vague uh, because for example, a simple word such as a predicate like tall can be represented in so many different ways and also raw means tall for example, if you say that thing and the next question that comes to us is uh, how tall he is. This is the case that uh, 6.8 is considered to be should be considered to be tall or 5.8 is to be considered to be tall or what will happen to those cases in which uh, which falls between 5.8 definitely you know we consider that they are definitely you know taller and all and those cases in which you know they fall between 5.8 and 6.2 etc. So, English language is a little bit vague and all. So, uh, uh, we might make some mistakes in the argumentation especially when 
uh, we uh, shift the meaning of the words that uh, that you, uh, that we use in the argumentation then we talk about some kind of fallacies which arises out of grammatical uh, errors etc and all so these kinds of fallacies come under the category of fallacies arising out of uh, ambiguity of language so then we will discuss about detecting and avoiding fallacies this is the this is the program uh, this is the agenda for uh, under this fallacies so so in this lecture i will be focusing on formal fallacies and the informal fallacies especially the fallacies of relevance so before i continue then let us talk about what we mean by a fallacy so it is used as a synonym for any kind of position that is false or sometimes even deceptive or sometimes it is even applied to some kind of narrow sense to some kind of faulty process of reasoning so we talked about uh, different kinds of reasoning inductive and deductive reasoning etc so if both su such kind of reasoning is defective uh, then uh, that, that is considered to be some kind of faulty process of reasoning you know or sometimes it uh, an arguer might uh, want to trick uh, use some kind of tricks and all especially to persuade the reader or listener or mostly these are all some kind of specious persuasions and all so uh, so what is uh, uh, these are all persuasive kind of mechanisms and all so but logically speaking they are all considered to be mistakes in the argumentation and all and hence they are called as fallacies so they might not be considered to be fallacy fallacy in a sense of uh, in a psychological sense etc and all all these uh, fallacies might be of some importance there but as far as uh, logic is concerned they are all considered to be fallacies you know so one one must note that there are many arguments which are very persuasive and all they are all not good arguments and all so how to distinguish good argument from a bad argument etc this is the question that will be we have asked in the last uh, few lectures as well as we will be asking this lecture even uh, we will be asking this question even in these lectures as well so mere persuasive mechanisms will not serve as a good uh, or effective kind of argument so there might be some kind of errors or defects or mistakes in the argumentation sometimes arguer deliberately makes it sometimes the arguer might make it out of inno ignorance or uh, sometimes you know you just want to persuade uh, his reader or listener to accept his claims you know so fallacies in a sense uh, it's nothing but some kind of mistake in the argumentation now this mistakes might arise in in many different ways that is what we are trying to look into uh, in a greater detail you know so a fallacy is a defect in an argumentation other than merely false premises so just because uh, an argument has a false premise that doesn't mean that it's a uh, it's uh, it is considered to be a fallacy and all there are many arguments which have false premises but it these kinds of arguments are valid and all for example if you say uh, all squares are circles all circles are parallelograms all squares are parallelograms and all so the conclusion seems to be obviously okay for us but uh, the premises are obviously false that doesn't mean that there is a mistake in that argumentation uh, but at this argument is considered to be valid now since we don't want these kinds of arguments in day to day discourse so we do not use these kinds of uh, arguments so we invoke another kind of property which we have seen in the last few lectures under basic concepts that is uh, the concept of soundness a sound argument is a, a deductive argument in which uh, it's a valid as well as it, it has true premises so fallacy is a term the term which is used for fallacy is non sequitur that means it does not follow and that means it is an invalid kind of argument is another name for fallacy you know mostly it is used in 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 the context of formal kind of fallacies so there are two kinds of fallacies that we commonly come across so one particular kind of fallacy is a little bit straight forward and all just by seeing the form itself we can make out that there is a mistake in the uh, uh, a mistake in the argumentation and all so once you extract the form and all if it is an invalid form obviously it is an invalid argument and all and hence it is a fallacy automatically all invalid arguments are automatically considered to be fallacious arguments so what is a formal fallacy a formal fallacy is an again error in error or mistake in the reasoning 
that involves the explicit use of an invalid form. For example, instead of A implies B A and B follows that is a modus ponens rule uh, which we have seen earlier. Uh, instead of that we use A implies B and B and it, it leads to A then that that is considered to be uh, a mistake in the argumentation and mistake in the way very way you use the forms and all you have not used in a valid uh, you have not used in a correct sense so so that is why it is called as a formal fallacy. So formal fallacies can be identified just by seeing the form itself if, they, if you find invalid form obviously it is a fallacious argument and it is uh, called as a formal fallacy. Informal fallacies on the other hand are not that easy to identify so they do not have a fixed form form etc and all. So informal fallacies are errors in reasoning that do not involve the explicit use of an invalid form in the day to day argumentation it is not it is not easy to extract form all the time and all it is not easy to identify what exactly the arguer is trying to argue or intend to uh, claim etc a claim is considered with the conclusion. So those kinds of fallacies in which I mean uh, you can make out that there is a mistake in the argumentation only by seeing or analyzing the content of an argument they are called as informal fallacies. For example you know the lots of examples we have seen already in the last few lectures for example if you say this room is made up of atoms atoms are invisible so this room is invisible you know suppose if you say that particular kind of thing unless and until you analyze the content of the argument that means the words that you have used in your argument there is no way in which you can identify mistake in the argumentation. So detecting an informal fallacy requires an examination of arguments content and all unless until you analyze the content of an argument there is no way in which you can identify the mistakes in the argumentation. So these kinds of fallacies are called as informal fallacies to be simple in simple terms formal fallacies can be identified by uh, so somewhat some mistake in the form and informal fallacies can easily be identified by not easily but it can be identified by uh, analyzing the content of the argument and all. So how, how did we uh, get into this particular kind of uh, uh, in, uh, some kind of interest in this fallacies and all we are saying that all fallacies are persuasive kind of mechanisms and all at the same time we are saying that uh, not all persuasive kind of arguments are good arguments are efficient or effective kind of arguments and all. So, so what are the characteristics of a good argument or effective argument? So we already said about this thing so it has to be deductively valid it is well and good if, you, if it is deductively valid or at least it should be inductively strong in the case of inductive arguments you can only talk about strength of the argument so that is why it has to be strong and of course if it has true premises it is called as in the case of inductive argument it is called as a cogent argument in the case of deductive argument it is called as a sound argument a sound argument is a valid argument with true premises if that is the case then it seems to be a good and effective kind of argument or it has a validity and truth truth of the premises be evident as far as possible to the parties involved suppose two people are arguing with each other they know that some of the statements that an arguer has used also happen to be factually true as well so that makes this argument sound and all of course validity does not require that the truth of the premises to be actually true and all but if there is an inferential claim that is well and uh, good enough for, uh, for, for talking about the validity and all. So both parties that means who those who are, whosoever is engaged in argumentation should be able to find out that the argument is valid as well as, well as it has true premises then it is well and good so that, that will constitute uh, a good argument. And the premises should be stated clearly uh, using some kind of understandable language uh, and making clear what the premises and the conclusions are etc and all it has to nicely uh, that means it the argument has to be some kind of well crafted kind of argument and all. So if that is the case then uh, if you know what premises are what conclusions are then you will automatically know what seems to be supporting what etc and uh, so you need to avoid for a good argument uh, you need to uh, I mean avoid circularity ambiguity 
and sometimes we will be uh, using a lot of emotional language into the arguments and then basically our purpose is to, uh, to, to make the reader or listener accept your, uh, our claims and all. So one needs to ensure that there is no circularity in the argument one simple example could be for example somebody is arguing uh, that uh, I believe that God exists is true and all. Suppose if you ask him why you believe that God exists is true and all. So then you will say that uh, this is what Bible says so. Then the next question that you will come across is uh, what is the guarantee that what Bible says is true or what Quran or Gita says is true. Then you will argue that uh, God is true he, he talks of talks of only truths and whatever he has written it is, the Bible is written Gita or Quran are written by God only it is God's words only they are obviously true etc. Then again you ask uh, what is the guarantee that these words are true I mean these statements that you are that are there in the Bible is true again you will say that God exists etc. Now this leads to it begs some question at each and every stage you are um, there it leads to some kind of circularity in an argumentation and all. as far as possible you should ensure that there is no circularity in uh, in your arguments and all and so it has to be relevant to the issue at hand and all. For example if you say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 and then and moon is made up of green cheese and you will infer 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 there is no relevance between moon is made up of green cheese and 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 and all although it looks like that from A and B you are deriving B but does it does not make any sense to we do not make such kind of uh, uh, claims in uh, in logic in particular but although it is formally valid and uh, it follows and all but usually you know that is that is not considered to be a good argument 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 and moon is made up of green cheese hence moon is, moon is made up of green cheese from A and B B follows. So the next question that uh, arises in our mind is this that how these fallacies arises. So people are often more interested in convincing rather than seeking the truth of the matter. So we might be impatient or we might be uh, we want others to accept our claims and all. So somehow we want to convince others and all you will forget about what <laughs> whether the conclusion is true or whether the conclusion follows from the premises or is there any support of premises to the conclusion all these things we will set it aside and then we will um, we will mix up uh, these arguments with lot of emotions uh, etc and all. So maybe because of that these fallacies might arise or otherwise uh, we often find uh, in the argumentation uh, these are the some of the arguments that you will often find it uh, uh, in the arguments of advertisers in particular an advertising agency wants. Uh, uh, is customers to buy some particular kind of thing uh, I mean uh, people to buy some particular kind of item they will use uh, some uh, good solid advertisements and all uh, etc and all advocates use it in the courts politicians try to woo the customers uh, who the voters in particular so then they might use this uh, fallacies as a persuasive mechanism uh, our political pund pundits might use it in analyzing uh, who is going to I mean uh, political points might use it uh, in some sense in a broad sense fallacy is any argument that involves some kind of faulty reasoning as far as logic is concerned. So they may be they may follow psychological they might be psychologically relevant and all but as far as logic is concerned they are they are all they are considered to be mistakes in the argumentation. So now let us go into the details of uh, formal fallacies first and then we will move on to informal fallacies little bit later. So two commonly these are the two commonly found kind of fallacies in uh, in logic that is uh, when these rules are used in not in a proper way then it leads to formal kind of fallacies and all. So these fallacies are uh, like this uh, the first one is uh, if A implies B and then B then if it leads to A then there is a mistake in the argumentation that I will talk about it a little bit later and the other one which you will commonly find is A implies B and not A and not B. So this is called as a fallacy of affirming the consequent affirming the consequent. 
we will talk about some examples related to both these things. So, these are called as formal fallacies. And this is called as fallacy, which arises because of uh, denial of constituent, denial of uh, antecedent. So, uh, these are all invalid forms, obviously, they are invalid arguments. So, we said that uh, all invalid arguments are automatically fallacious and all. So, now why uh, where is what is the valid form of this one? This is the one which we should use and all if a implies b is the case this is an hypothetical situation and then if a is indeed true then we can infer that b follows from these two things. And the other the correct usage of uh, this one is this a implies b and you deny the consequent and then you need to deny the antecedent. So, first of all, so this is called as antecedent. So, this is a conditional statement, and A is called as antecedent, and B is called as a consequent, and then that makes this A implies B some kind of hypothetical statement. Now, if it rains, the grass is wet. So, if this is assumed to be true, and then B is also assumed to be true, then we need to see whether A is true or false. So, the correct forms are these two things, but as you see here clearly instead of using this valid form we, are, we have used invalid forms in all. all invalid forms are automatically uh, invalid arguments. So, that is why they are all fallacious in all it is pretty straightforward and simple to identify these kinds of fallacies. So, formal fallacies usually grouped into two kinds of fallacies one is fallacy of affirming the consequent instead of affirming the antecedent you are affirming the consequent and all. Of course, you might say that in day to day uh, argumentation uh, we will this seems to be some kind of uh, valid argument and all. There is a kind of uh, reasoning which uh, we, uh, we we did not discuss in this particular kind of we do not discuss in this particular kind of course. So, that kind of reasoning is called as abductive reasoning. So, this abductive reasoning. So, in that what we will do is this that uh, this kind of uh, principle A implies B and B and then from that it seems to be the case that A follows from this particular kind of thing. So, these kinds of uh, reasonings uh, reasoning is the one which we are not going to talk about and abductive inferences are also called as inference to the best explanations and all. So, it is like uh, for example, detectives or doctors who are diagnosing some kind of disease they use this kind of reasoning and all in day to day discourse. So, they are of the view that, I mean of course, uh, a detective is trying to find out whether or not murder took place etcetera in a certain place etcetera and all. So, you might find uh, he will just hypothetically state a particular kind of statement A implies B if murder took place then there would be some kind of blood stains etcetera. So, then uh, detective first you will find some kind of blood stains etcetera and all that will make him infer that there was some some kind of murder took place in that particular kind of room and all. It seems to be a little bit sensible in the actual day to day situations and all, but this uh, this kind of reasoning is a kind of fallacious reasoning in term as far as logic is concerned. Since it is not used in a valid form and all you can always come up with a counter example in which A implies B is true and B is true, but A can be false and all. But in day to day discourse you might find some examples where uh, this seems to be convincing for you a detective might use this particular kind of thing you know he has an hypothetical situation A implies B and then B is indeed the case and all at least you know that uh, evidence confirms that this is the case. And then from this he will explain that probably A might be uh, the best explanation for these two things to be true and all. So, this is called as inference to the best explanation. So, this is one not what we are trying to use uh, here and all abductive reasoning is not the one which we are going to talk about. 
so but here so these are the two fallacies in which you know they are logically uh, invalid forms and all so that is why they are automatically invalid kind of arguments and all but the correct forms of this one is uh, are these things a implies b and a and b follows this is called as modus ponens rule and this is called as modus tollens so these are somewhat latin names and all but usually it is represented as mt and mp modus ponens and modus tollens so so these are the correct forms these are the uh, incorrect forms that's why they are invalid arguments are automatically fallacious and all so now we can come up with uh, lots of examples for these particular kind of uh, arguments that are there on the top of this uh, thing so uh, one example could be uh, if 2523 is divisible by 9 then it has to be divisible by 3 and all so that is seems to be a little bit acceptable to us and all anything divided by 9 it should be divided by 3 also and then you are saying that 2523 is divisible by 3 so it also happened that 2523 is divisible by 3 so then uh, it is also divis divisible by 9 and all it may not be the case that it may be may be divisible by 9 and all the better examples which you can take into consideration so this is like a fallacy of affirming the consequent of uh, consequent and all so this comes under the category uh, 2 sorry first one so you are affirming the consequent and then you are affirming the antecedent and all here the best example could be like this suppose if you are in uh, Kanpur then you are in Uttar Pradesh because Kanpur is in Uttar Pradesh only you have to be in Uttar Pradesh only so if I am in Uttar Pradesh so that is also considered to be the case then it follows that you are in Kanpur and all you might be in any one any part of Uttar Pradesh and all but does not mean that you are in Kanpur and all the first one I am in Kanpur is represented as A I am in Uttar Pradesh is represented as B and then I am in Uttar Pradesh is represented as B uh, uniformly we represent it with the help of some symbols then I am in Kanpur is the one which is uh, uh, which follows from these two uh, one is the hypothetical statement and the other one is uh, uh, I mean uh, the, the statement that I am in Uttar Pradesh now you might be in Uttar Pradesh but uh, you might be in Agra or you might be in some other part of the city maybe some other place and all or Bareilly or some other place and all but you need not have to be in Kanpur and all so that is a single counter example which shows that this argument does not follow and all so all the fallacious arguments are obviously uh, they are all invalid arguments are automatically fallacious they are formal fallacies and all so other examples could be the same example can be represented in different way if I am in Kanpur then I am in Uttar Pradesh uh, so I am not in Kanpur uh, then you are not in Uttar Pradesh and all so that is the one which uh, follows from this particular kind of thing or you can take another example to establish this uh, thing uh, that fallacy of denial of antecedent and fallacies of affirming the uh, consequent leads to the mistake in the argumentation so they are all invalid arguments and all if you get hit by a car when you are sick when you are at 6 then you will die young obviously 6 uh, anyone dies uh, you will die young only but you are not hit by the car when you are 6 that does not mean that you know you will not die young and all maybe the next year or maybe next incident you might die and all so so you could be hit by a truck at the age of 7 or maybe some other thing might happen you might die out of disease or some incurable disease or something like that so what is important here is is that invalid form means an invalid argument and invalid arguments are automatically fallacious and all so when an argument is invalid there is it is always be the case that you know you can always come up with premises true and a conclusion false and all so it is possible that you know you could come up with uh, premises true and a conclusion false that makes this argument invalid and all for example if you say grass is wet uh, if it rains the grass is wet so then then you are saying that uh, grass is wet and all so just because the grass is wet does not mean that if you infer that it rained and all 
and there, there seems to be some mistakes in the argumentation. Grass might be wet in several other ways as well. The sprinkler might be on, or maybe somebody throw poured some water there, etc. And all. There is some leakage of water from tap some somewhere, etc. And all these things might be reasons for grass being wet and all. So these are some of the formal. Uh, there, there are some problems with the form usage of the form. So that leads to uh, the mistake in the argumentation. They are pretty straightforward to identify. All the things which I mentioned it here are uh, will come under the category of categorical syllogisms, which I am going to talk about a little bit later. Categorical syllogisms are special kind of arguments in which uh, it involves only categorical prepositions. And categorical propositions are just their propositions, but they have a special feature that all these propositions begin with uh, all, no, some, etc. And all. Every, all these things comes under the category of uh, uh, categorical propositions. For example, if you say all men are mortal, some men are mortal, all men are not mortal, some men are not mortal. All these things are called as categorical propositions. So now the ones which I have stated here all these things are invalid arguments because it has invalid form and all. Uh, as I said uh, as I said in the counter example method whenever you have an invalid argument um, suppose if uh, you, you start with some set which has, uh, which has all the things that you, are ob you obviously know that they are true or false etc and all. For example if you say all cats are dogs then the statement is false and all anyone would be able to believe that the particular kind of thing is false and all all cats are animals seems to be acceptable to us that is true statement and all. So there are certain things which are obvious to us which we, uh, nobody could deny and all. So those things which take into consideration and then substitute it for A, B, C, etc and all and see whether you could come up with any counter, inst uh, counter example and all. That counter example in a sense that uh, you have true premises and a false conclusion. Suppose if you say all A's are B's, all C's are B's. So all A's are C's and all. So the actual valid form is all A's are B's, all B's are C's and all A's are C's. But here it is not used in that particular kind of form. So that is why this is considered to be an invalid uh, form. So that is why these are called as fallacious argument. So what seems to be the valid arguments are uh, this thing all A's are B's, this A's, B's can be anything and all. You can substitute for A, you can substitute for B, donkey, cat, it does not matter. All B's are C's, so then all A's are C's. So, this is a kind of a valid kind of argument and all. It is a valid form, so that is why it is called as a valid kind of argument. We might ask uh, how do we know that this is a valid argument, etc. So then the for the definition of validity is this that the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and all that means you cannot come up with a counter example in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false and all. How, whatever you substitute for A's, B's etc and all, B's, C's etc then if these two are assumed to be true then the second one the whatever follows from these two things should also be true and all. So, so deductive arguments truth preserving conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and all. So the one which we have used here are all A's are B's uh, it is like uh, all A's are B's somewhat like all C's are all C's are what all C's are B's so all uh, that is uh, all A's are C's. So if you compare these two things this is considered to be a valid form and this is not an invalid form and all. Suppose if you are not convinced with this particular kind of thing that when I say that this is an invalid form that is why it is an invalid argument it is a valid form and it is a valid argument then uh, there are certain things which we are uh, which we know that they are obviously true obviously false etc. So instead of uh, in this one you substitute A for cat or B for animal or C for some kind of rat or something like that then you will see whether this follows or not. So the example here is this that for A's we have taken into consideration dogs that is all dogs are animals which is obviously the case and all a dog cannot be some other thing and all 
a fish or something like that. So that is satis that is satisfying the first statement and all C's are B's here C is considered to be cats so all cats are also animals so from that you infer that all A's are C's for example all A's means A means dogs and all, all dogs are cats suppose if you say that particular kind of thing although the premises the first two premises are true that is all dogs are animals all cats are also animals but yet if you infer that all dogs are cats then that uh, the conclusion is false given the premises are true and all that means you could easily come up with uh, some kind of counter example for that particular example. the counter example is, is that you, you come up with uh, with the true premises you come up with a false conclusion all dogs are cats so at least all of us uh, will be easy it will be easy to say that all cats are dogs is obviously false and all. so like this whenever you come across an invalid form you can always come up with a counter instance where uh, you have true premises and a false conclusion that makes that argument invalid invalid arguments are automatically fallacious by virtue of the form itself because it we used in invalid form so that is why these arguments are invalid so like this uh, we can come across the valid form is that one this is our valid form and all we have used in different ways and all so that is why it is invalid form that is why it is invalid and all all A's are B's no C is A and no C is B and all so whether this particular kind of argument is valid or invalid then again you know there are certain things which are quite obvious to us you substitute A for cat and B for animal and C for dog and all and then see what happens here so all A's are B's instead of all every they are all same and all one of the same so you say all in every cat is an animal is as good as saying the same thing all uh, cats are animals so that is the first uh, proposition and the second one is no C is A that means no dog is a cat dog can be different from the cat and all so that satisfies the second proposition in the uh, in this thing and then from that no C is B that is no dog is an animal so you you could uh, easily come up with a counter example where the, the premises every cat is an animal is true no cat no dog is a cat is also true but the conclusion no dog is an animal is false and all so like this uh, uh, whenever you have an invalid arguments I do not want to go into the details of other arguments and all they are all invalid uh, forms and all invalid arguments and hence they are invalid arguments and all whenever you come across an invalid argument you can substitute these instances etc instead of uh, A's, B's, C's, etc., and all you substitute dogs, cats, animals, etc., without disturbing the truth value of the propositions and see whether you could come across with a counter example. I mean, you could come across with a false conclusion. And all. True premises should not lead to false conclusion. And all. A valid deductive argument is the one in which it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion is false, even if you could come up with a single instance where your premises are true and the conclusion is false then that particular kind of argument is invalid so far we have seen uh, that you know arguments are uh, invalid just because of uh, the fact that you know they are, they are having invalid forms and all life uh, is not that simple and all so we need to uh, we need to analyze the content of the argument to see whether there is any mistake in the argumentation and all so these kinds of fallacies are called as fallacies of relevance sorry fallacies informal fallacies and one particular kind of fallacy which arises very frequently in day to day discourse especially when two arguers are engaged in some kind of debate or, or when, when an arguer presents some kind of thing to convince the reader or listener you will find these kinds of fallacies which arises out of the problem of relevance and all. I will talk about what we mean by relevance etc a little bit later but uh, uh, so this fallacies uh, fallacies of relevance arises in involve the use of premises that are logically irrelevant to their conclusion and all. for an argument the basic structure is, is that you have a premise and then premise should lead to premise should have some provide some kind of adequate support to believe that uh, your conclusion to be true and all but it doesn't provide any adequate reasons to believe the conclusion to be true then there seems to be some kind of uh, problem 
uh, here the problem arises because the premises are not logically relevant to their conclusions and all there are some other relevant factors which uh, comes into picture and all. So these uh, relevant factors may be psychologically relevant factors and all it might be pity it might be uh, uh, anger it may be frustration all these things are psychologically relevant factors and all sometimes we do you we do take into consideration all these factors and sometimes the argument may be a good argument as well. Sometimes we, we invoke some kind of patriotism and then we will infer some kind of thing but yet that argument may be may be convincing for all of us but it might turn out to be fallacious for us. So here the, uh, the most important feature that you need to uh, look for is, is that are they logically relevant or psychologically relevant and all. I am not saying that uh, psychological reasons are not important or useless etc and all as far as uh, logical uh, reasoning is concerned uh, as far as possible a good argument should be free from all these uh, psychological uh, psychologically relevant factors and all. But in day to day discourse we do take into consideration these particular kind of uh, uh, factors etc psychological reasons and all. So the, here is a list of uh, uh, fallacies which come under the category of fallacies of relevance. Uh, you should note that you know there is no way in which you can classify these fallacies into one group or another group and all different text textbooks have different classifications and all. So the book that we are following is uh, concise introduction to logic by Patrick Hurley it seems that you know these things are classified in a very nice way and all in this book. So we are referring to that particular book uh, in which you know things are classified in a very nice way. So we believe that uh, this this is a very good kind of classification and all. So we follow this particular kind of thing. So what are fallacies of relevance? Uh, there are different names and all. So, you know, mostly you know these kinds of fallacies are already there right from antiquity onwards. That means uh, right from the Greeks period onwards, you will find you might have uh, come across uh, uh, from Greek period onwards. These fallacies exist. Um, and these exist even in day to day uh, is even now also. So the first one is uh, appeal to force uh, this is also called as argumentum ad baculum they are the Latin names and the second one is uh, instead of uh, uh, arguing the arguers uh, argument you will attack him in, in person and all. So ad hominem argument when you invoke pity it leads to appeal to pity kind of fallacy the other kind of fallacy which you will commonly come across is appeal to people and fallacy of accident missing the point strawman fallacy and red herring fallacies and all. in all these fallacies what is uh, what is the problem is is that the premises are not logically relevant to the conclusion but premises may be psychologically relevant to the conclusions and all. So let us look into each one of these fallacies in some detail uh, uh, some greater detail. The first one is a, a simple kind of fallacy which, which is called as appeal to force. Appeal to force or it is called as ad baculum fallacy which occurs when a conclusion is defended by some kind of a, a threat to the well being of those who do not accept it. So this threat can be sometimes explicit sometimes it can be even implicit in all. So this uh, argument uh, has this particular kind of uh, structure so you can draw the diagram for this particular kind of uh, uh, fallacy then you will come to know where lies the who is who seem to have committed this particular kind of uh, fallacy. So now here is an, uh, an arguer he is presenting some kind of argument now. So this is what is called as appeal to appeal to force. So what A does is here is uh, your reader or listener R stands for reader or sometimes it can be listener also that means you are reading a text or you are listening to someone's argument and all. So now these arrows are important so A threatens A threatens reader or listener and he poses this particular kind of conclusion. So A threatens reader and listener and all and he poses a conclusion ultimately his, his uh, purpose is, is that 
he wants the reader or listener to accept his claims and all. So in the process you know he might do it in several ways and all to persuade the reader or listener to accept his claims and all. So one way which, which he does in this case is, is that he threatens the reader or listener if you do not accept whatever he says to be true and all then he will say that there is some kind of consequence which follows and all. So this particular kind of thing is called as appeal to force kind of fallacy and all. So basically this threatening can be some kind of physical threat you will directly say that I am going to beat you or something like that or he might say that some kind of event pose some kind of mental threat you know. he will invoke some kind of fear in you he might say that he will leak your information etc. You know. So this kind of thing is called as appeal to force and all here what you will see here is, is that the premises may not be relevant to the conclusion and all. So since he has incorporated threaten, threatening into picture and all so there are all maybe psychological factors etc and all sometimes he might use it for the well being of uh, uh, the reader or a listener or a person who is in whom the arguer is trying to persuade but in not in all the cases it might be used for the well being of uh, uh, a reader or listener and all. So the structure of this argument is, is that of course these are premises and conclusions premises could be this you can avoid harm by accepting this particular kind of statement and all. So that is why this statement is true. So what he says is, is that he threatens the reader or listener why he threatens the reader or listener he says that you are going to avoid some kind of harm etc and all. If you do not do this thing you will you have to face the music and all so you have to uh, attract some kind of uh, fine or it may be you will be punished etc and all. So this is the one which we commonly come across uh, uh, in day to day discourse also so where uh, uh, what the arguer is trying to do is, is that you can avoid harm by accepting this particular kind of statement and all. So what is the statement that he wants uh, his reader or listener to uh, accept and all that is a conclusion he is posing some kind of conclusion and all. if you do not accept the conclusion then he says that there is some harm is going to happen to that particular kind of person. So out of fear the reader or listener might accept his claim and all but here the premises are nothing to do with uh, uh, the conclusion and all so only threat is what is making him to believe the conclusion to be true and all. So some examples which you take into consideration and then we will see we will understand this uh, kind of fallacy in greater detail. Now here uh, the arguer is threatening the reader or listener and then ultimately what the intention of an arguer is, is that reader or listener accept whatever the conclusion that he is making and all he has to accept this particular kind of statement which is there in the conclusion. So now who is said to have committed the mistake in the argumentation A is said to have committed this fallacy and all if somebody presents this particular kind of argument and all then we should be in a immediately in a position to say that since A has used threatening and all kinds of things and all that should not be relevant to uh, believing this particular kind of statement and all. So some examples which we will see in uh, greater detail so this is reminiscent, reminiscent of scenes in films about organized crime etc children arguing with the uh, parents uh, or children arguing with each other etc not with the parents one example is like this Mr. Salim you helped us import the drugs somebody is arguing like this somebody is threatening Salim and all here for this the boss is obviously grateful and all but now you say you are entitled to 45 percent of the profits and all. So now he started claiming his share and all now boss is very angry on this particular kind of thing the boss says that you are entitled to only 10 percent and all you are claiming excessive and all although you helped us in importing some illegal drugs etc and all okay that is fine well and good and all. But now you are asking uh, you deserve only 10 percent but you are asking 45 percent and all. So your boss is very angry etc. This is what you see in the organized crime and all. So the next statement is unless you see things in boss way that means you do not unless if you do not listen to what the boss is trying to say that is you be happy with uh, only 10 percent of the share etc. So that is what is unless you see the things in boss way 
you are going to have a very nasty kind of accident you might boss might kill you or he might uh, do something or other some kind of harm is going to happen to you a middle kind of some broker kind of person is trying to convince the reader or listener so that you know if you accept uh, you know whatever boss says that is if he is happy with the 10 percent and all no threat is going to happen to him otherwise uh, he is going to face some kind of uh, nasty accident you will come across some kind of nasty accident and all. So, you are entitled to 10 percent only. So, ultimately he is saying you got my point or not if you do not get my point you are going to be punished and all. So, so what is happening here is this that uh, there is some kind of arguer here is arguing with Salim and all. So, Salim here he is a reader or listener the arguer is someone arguing in favor of uh, in favor of his boss and all big boss Don or something like that. So, who is said to have committed a mistake the arguer who is uh, arguing for the for the boss and all whosoever is arguing that you deserve only 10 percent etcetera. So, he seems to be committing this particular kind of fallacy and all why he has committed fallacy because all these things uh, are not uh, relevant for uh, this particular kind of thing that you know that whatever is claiming that is 45 percent profits etcetera and all. So, instead of uh, here uh, the all the irrelevant things are like this that you know the broker who is arguing in favor of uh, the arguer is trying to threaten the threaten Salim here. So, he is saying that you know unless until you accept uh, bosses whatever boss is saying then you are going to invite some kind of problems and all. So, here the first one is that the threatened nasty incident has no logical relevance on the conclusion that Salim is entitled to only 10 percent and all they are nothing to do with this particular kind of thing they are only psychologically or uh, relevant to this particular kind of thing. But yet this is used as some kind of persuasive mechanism and all if you are uh, uh, this can still be used as some kind of persuasive mechanism and all a broker who is arguing for uh, some kind of boss and all uh, that you know ultimately is trying to negotiate with uh, Salim that you know he deserves only 10 percent rather than 45 percent and all. If he claims 45 percent then the broker is saying that you know he will attract he will face some kind of problems etcetera and all he is trying to negotiate or persuade the reader or listener by invoking some kind of threat. So, suppose in this case the arguer is said to have committed this particular kind of fallacy this particular kind of fallacy is called as appeal to force kind of fallacy. So, the persuasion is this that you can avoid harm by accepting this this statement this statement is is that you know you deserve only 10 percent of the thing you know. So, his statements are based on threat so and if he says that the statement is true then there seems to be some mistake in the argumentation. So, this is what happens here premises is is that you can avoid harm by accepting this statement the conclusion is that hence that statement is true and all. So, premises are irrelevant to the conclusion and, all and hence leads to fallacies of relevance and this fallacy of relevance. Uh, can be further classified into the fallacies of uh, relevance which arises due to appeal to force. Sometimes uh, this threat arguer uh, threaten the reader or listener and poses a conclusion and this particular kind of threat can be even a psychological threat also it can be a mental kind of threat. So, this is what you commonly see in uh, organizations in particular where the secretary is arguing with his boss. So, he is saying this particular kind of thing I deserve promotions with increments etcetera all the time you know he is worried about his increments etcetera and all he got somehow he is claiming with his boss that he should be promoted this particular kind of year and all. So, he says till here it is fine and all but his claim is based on some other irrelevant factors and all He's, he goes on and says that after all you know how friendly I am with your wife and I am sure you would not want her to find out what kind of affair has been going on between you and that of yours. Somehow he had some developed some kind of relations with his wife and that uh, she does not know and all the boss's wife does not know. So, now he is threatening uh, uh, the boss that you know if you do not promote me and all I am going to expose everything to your wife and all. So, I know you have been lying to your wife about what you are what is where uh, about where you go on on Wednesdays afternoons etcetera and all all these things are irrelevant for the promotion and all unless you want her to know where you really go 
it is time for you to realize that you have no choice then rising my salary and all. You raise my salary or promote me otherwise I am going to leak all the information and all. So this is some kind of psychological threat that the secretary is trying to some kind of blackmailing is trying to do. So here in this case secretary seems seem to have committed fallacy and there is a mistake in his argumentation because all these factors whether the boss is having relation with someone else etc all these things have nothing to do with his promotion and all. The promotion what is relevant maybe uh, yes achieved something some task some some other things might play a crucial role uh, in the promotion and all his performance etc. So the threat to expose the lie in no way constitutes evidence for one's promotion and all it has nothing to do with uh, this particular kind of thing. So this, this is the problem of uh, relevance and then we will continue with uh, other kinds of fallacies uh, in the next lecture.